This episode is brought to you by our incredible community of listener supporters on Patreon. Our Patreon offers listeners exclusive archival content, extended episodes, and access to community conversations diving deeper with past guests. Right now, we are $2,000 away from reaching our $5,000 of listener support each month. Your monthly pledge ensures that For the Wild has the funding to keep producing informative, thoughtful, and rooted conversations and programming. All funding supports our small team of creatives, podcast production, and special For the Wild projects like our zines and slow study courses. To support us on Patreon, please visit patreon.com slash for the wild, or if you would rather make a one-time donation or recurring donation outside of Patreon, please visit for the wild.world slash donate. Hello and welcome to For the Wild Podcast. I'm Ayana Young. Today we are speaking with Abina Afe Jima. Who gets to determine whose food is more valuable? All foods are valuable. And I think it's important to how African farmers farm. They carry the ancestral knowledge. They carry the ancestral wisdom. Farming is a way of life. It's not separate from the farmer. It's not separate from your neighbor. It's not separate from connection. Abina Afejima is the founder of Bila, Center for Indigenous Foods in Ghana, a project that seeks to preserve indigenous African seeds, foods, and practices. Prior to this role, Abina worked as the project lead for the Jane Finch Community Research Partnership with extensive experience in community engagement, ethical research, program development, partnerships, and collaboration and with previous organizations like North York Community House, Black Creek Community Farm, Jane Finch Center, and with Building Roots Toronto. Abina brings years of experience in conducting ethical community-engaged research practice, work in local food systems, seed sovereignty, and collaboration in food sovereignty movements. Abina is a writer, a poet, a researcher, a naturalist, and a conservationist. Oh, Avina, thank you so much for joining us today. While researching for this conversation, I was really drawn to your work and really appreciative of all of the threads that you pull on. So I'm excited to get into it. Thank you for having me. I'm excited and I honestly can't wait to have this conversation. Oh, good. So we're on the same page. Okay, let's see. As we begin, I think it would be really helpful to come to an understanding about what ancestral foods are, as so much of your work focuses on preserving ancestral foods and traditions. And in Ancestral Foods, Cultural Heritage, and Old Ways of Living, you write, quote, I define ancestral foods as local, organic, seasonal, and environmentally sustainable foods indigenous to a particular geographic region that locals have consumed for thousands of years, end quote. So I love if you could elaborate a bit more on what ancestral food means both technically and culturally. Yeah, thank you for that. I just, well, it was just lovely hearing you read that back. I think culturally, ancestral foods are foods that are tied to our culture foods that are tied to our traditions and foods that are tied right to our DNA, to our gut health, foods that our grandparents, great-grandparents ate hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And I think when we think about ancestral food, it's not just for consumption, right? I think about the traditions and the practices that come with those foods. You know, now when we go to the grocery store, let me put it this way, but when I go to the grocery store, there isn't a direct relationship between myself, the person, and the food that's on the shelf. It's like, I'm hungry. Let me grab this food and pay for it and go home. You know, but with ancestral foods, there's a connection, right? There is an intimacy that comes with that food. There is a story that's attached to that food. I think about millet, for instance, and 
my mother tells me the story of my grandfather who would never leave the house, right? Without drinking this millet beverage that we have in the morning. They call it Zom, where I'm from, in the northern part of Ghana. And so my mom now in Toronto makes a millet meal that we also consume. So I think even when I think about millet, it's not just a grain, right? It's a meal that has the story of my grandfather attached to it, the story of my mother attached to it. Millet also tells me that it's, it's healthy for us, right? It's a part of our lineage. It's a part of our DNA. My gut health knows it, recognizes it. And so I think that food is, ancestral foods bring the spiritual component of food that is often missing in the way that we may think and talk about food in this modern way. And I think, and you know, when you think about ancestral foods, ancestral foods is not separate from the ways in which we farm, separate from the ways in which we eat. It's not separate the ways in which we plant, the ways in which we harvest, right? Ancestral foods really look at farm to table, right? What, what is the relationship between the human and the soil and the culture and the tradition and the, and the trees and the ancestor that all contributed to make this food possible for us to consume it in the future, right? So the, the, the aspects of and lineage and heritage in ancestral foods, it's so crucial because it makes us realize that there were people before us that preserved this. For us to have this today, for me to hold a millet in my hand or to hold a sorghum in my hand or a banbari beans, someone preserved it years, right, before me and a year before me, 10 years before me, 20 years before me. And they were practiced this, grandparent used in preserving that food, you know, whether it was the festivals before the planting season, whether it was the prayers and festivities after the harvest season, all these were crucial part of preserving that food. So when I say ancestral food, it is in context to a certain geographic region is because every part of the world has its own ancestral foods, right? And we're, we're all connected, but we find ourselves also coming from different parts of the world. And in the different parts of the world that we're coming from, yes, there is a shared land. The food's a part of our story as people. So an example is two years ago, I met a farmer in the northern part of Ghana. We've worked together since 2017. And I ended up going to his farm in December. And he had pumpkin. So we had pumpkin on the farm. I'm from the northern part of Ghana, but I've never actually seen pumpkin. And he was just telling me the story of like how pumpkin and millet and sorghum, banbara beans are usually grown together. And immediately I thought of the three sisters in North America, right? Like indigenous cultures in North America. And I thought, oh my God, it is the corn, the bean and the squash, right? Um, so those interconnections and just seeing foods that are connected in that way. But I think ancestral foods, I feel like we live in a time, I say my perspective, where it's almost like humans are seen as being above other living things or above trees and above seeds. And the work that trees and seeds and soils and grass and insects and fungi are all coexisting with us and are all playing equal part in it and maintaining this earth. And very often when we tell the story of foods, we eliminate all of that. And so for me, ancestral foods bring all that. There is a cultural aspect to food. There's a spiritual, there is a traditional aspect to food. And there are people, there are people before us that have maintained and sustained food systems, you know, ancestral food systems for us to be able to have a lot of these foods today. So. Yeah, ancestral food for me is about foods that are connected to our lineage, foods that are connected to our heritage, foods that remind us of our cultural practices and traditions. Ancestral foods also tell us about the ecosystem, right? They tell us about diversity, about tree that has lived for thousands of years, right? Tells us so much about pollinators and 
the ecosystem and biodiversity. Yeah, so for me, ancestral foods is really around bringing those linkages between like lineage and, and heritage and tradition and culture and ecosystems and knowing that the food just did not arise from anywhere. There are people that have participated in preserving, protecting the foods that we have now to ensure that we too can enjoy them. But can you imagine unfolding the story of a millet that has lived all these years? Can you imagine unfolding that story of like the farmer that formed it the year before and the one, two years before and three years before? Imagine all that stories, right? And all the practices that are now forward with me when I hold the millet seed in my hand. And for me, those stories are so important and they cannot be erased or discounted. So mm -hmm. I loved that introduction. I wanted to bring up some of your other writing. In devaluing of native African foods, you write, quote, although many communities have lost valuable ways of growing and preserving native foods or may have shifted from growing native foods to cash crops for the market. The role of native African food to sustaining Earth's ecosystem is not forgotten. As native African foods begin to gain momentum as superfoods in the health and wellness market, it's important that the shift to valuing native African foods is led by farmers, the communities who are able to sustain, preserve, and cherish these foods, most importantly, by Africans themselves, end quote. Yeah, so I'm wondering... How do we keep the value of these foods in the hands of those closest to their production, consumption, and ancestry? Capitalism is a very wild disease of extraction. But that, that, sorry, that's immediately what came to mind, just the impact of like capitalism on, and colonialism on our food systems. The stories we tell around other people's cultural and ancestral foods, right? From the lens of colonialism and capitalism. And so historically, African foods have been presented as backward, have been presented as poor people's food, have been presented as forgotten foods, misplaced, displaced, right? When it comes to African foods, there are many terminologies that are used to devalue the food. And in devaluing the food, the people are then devalued. The land is then devalued. The farmers is then devalued. And so many African farmers are presented as incapable of being able to sustain their own food systems, right? Disregarding the years of seed saving, right? The years of preserving the land. But the story, the dominant story that is being told is that the continent is poor, the farmers are poor, and that the land does not yield. And so that is the narrative that's being led. So I think a part of that is shifting the narrative that African foods are valuable. Africans can feed themselves and that the farmers have to because Farmers are literally archivists of the land, right? Like I, I think of farmers like Liberians, right? Because they have all this knowledge of the earth and of like the soil and they know when to plant, right? They know when it's about to rain, when certain birds fly away and certain worms are coming from the earth. They know when there's a shift in the smell in the environment. They can, they can just tell when it's about to rain. This is experiential knowledge that you you just cannot even purchase anywhere else but that knowledge is not valued in terms of how we think about knowledge and knowledge production right and so i think one part of that is shifting the narrative and shifting the stories of african food and of african farmers now how that happens i have to be honest and say I don't know because that is within the intersections of like capitalism and colonialism and imperialism and all these things that are, you know, moving and shaking. And so that's one part of the answer. The second part is that we can go and fix other people's issues, right? I intimately believe that everyone is a sovereign person. People are sovereign of themselves and sovereign of their culture and sovereign of their traditions. And that 
we don't necessarily have to go and fix. And I think because the dominant view is if we're not farming like how people are farming in the other part of the world, then they're not doing it right. And so I think that African farmers must lead because they are the stakeholders, right? Not only the first part in terms of having that intimate relationship with the land, being one with the land, knowing the soil, understanding crop rotation, you know, understanding agroecology. But the second part is that they are the biggest stakeholder. It is their land. They live there. It's part of their story. It's, I think it's really difficult. And I, I always have this internal challenge that the people that are most impacted are the ones that have to find the solutions for themselves. And that one cannot be outside of whatever the issue is and determine what the solution is. The value of African foods have to be led by African farmers because they are the stakeholders. They carry the ancestral knowledge. They carry the ancestral wisdom. Farming is not for profit in a lot of rural communities, right, across the African continent. Farming is a way of life. Farming season is about to happen in Bulga, you know, where I'm from. And people will leave their jobs. If they're farming a teacher, they will leave the teaching to go and farm because it's also how they've come to understand them, themselves. And I think a bigger part of that is because in terms of ancestral ways of being and seeing the world, the land is not separate from the farmer. The land is not just there. And then we enact an activity on it. There is respect for the land as a person, right? To thank the land for being available for us to grow food on. And I think because all these cultural belief system about food and seed and land, it's also important to how African farmers farm, right? And so it's important for them to lead because their culture, traditions, belief systems, religion are all an important part of how they understand land, how they understand food, their relationship with their food and farming systems. Yeah, I think the biggest aspect for me is that we can't necessarily see what a problem, what is perceived as a problem. And if an individual is not a stakeholder, how can we decide a solution for people that are most impacted African farmers or African communities that have the most stake have to lead that work because your food is an important part of how they've lived all these years because even the definition of food and farming is not separate from livelihood. You know, it's not separate from connection. It's not separate from your neighbor, you know? You can't visit a neighbor where I'm from in Bulga and they don't offer you food. Not because they have to, but because it's just a part of that tradition, you know? You've come a long way. You're visiting me. Wow, here's millet water and shea butter. I'm welcoming you, not just to rest, but to say this is also home, right? African farmers and communities bring who they are and their understanding of food, of land, of life, of connection, of community to how they live. And that influences how they think about food and land and farming, et cetera. And, and different parts of the world, right? We all have our own sort of definition of how we understand what it means to connect with food and land. And so, yeah, they can be a copy and paste, right? And I think for me, it's also like that part on, um, you know, having to lead the value of food is who gets to determine, right? Whose food is more valuable? <laughs> who gets to, to say that this food is more valuable and this food is less valuable? All foods are valuable because they have a greater connection beyond the human, the human eye and a greater contribution in sustaining biodiversity in ways that we don't always get to see and in ways that we don't always get to witness. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I want to go back to the article, Devaluing of Native African Foods. And you also write, quote, During colonialism, the degradation of Native African foods took shape. Indigenous grains, fruits, and vegetables became superseded, scorned, and regulated as poor people's food. While exportable cash crops such as cocoa, cotton, sugar, and etc. were cultured, harvested, graded, and protected against insects and pests with exceptional investment and researched. End quote. Huh, yeah, this, is, this feels so important for us to dive into because understanding this context, you know, how has colonialism shaped food taste and reputation and how has control over food been a particular tool of colonial control? Hmm. I'll give an example, I think. So this year is supposedly the year of the millets. So millet is an indigenous African grain. It was domesticated 4,000 years ago in West Africa. We have different varieties of millet, pearl millet, finger millet. And then there's also the fornia that's considered. And people have been eating millets for a very, very long time in many different ways. But somehow this year across the world is suddenly the year of millets. And so for me, I'm like, who gets to determine that a people's food that they have been consuming for a long time suddenly should be brought to the market? And is it not valuable if it's not brought to the market, right? And what happens next year and the year after that? Yeah, so I think what colonialism did, one, is the devaluation, right, of indigenous foods. Because what came with colonialism was whiteness, right? This idea of what it meant to live in the world. This idea of what it meant to eat food. Because culturally, we would eat food with our hand, right? You would eat food with your hand. And that was considered backward. So I think the bigger piece, I think what I'm trying to say here is that the devaluation of African food also came with a devaluation of the traditions and culture that is aligned with African indigenous foods. What also came with that was a devaluation of African farming methods that then were also seen as backward, right? And so the cultural foods that were not exportable were then seen as poor people's food, right? Because it aligned with that devaluation. If you devalue the food, the people are devalued. The process to which the food is produced is devalued. The farming systems are not valuable. You're not eating well if you're not eating foods that are in the market. But I think the devaluation was also then, how do we understand food, right? What is food? And how do we understand them? And if it's a food that is not in what we consider the markets, then is it poor people's food? So that, that devaluation happened on multiple levels and also in multiple layers. And it also impacted, I think one of the greatest impact was also then how many African people started to see their own foods and started to engage with their own foods. Because what happened was if you're told your food is for poor people and you're no longer aligned with your indigenous values, you're aligned with a different set of values that tells you that, you know, your ways are backward, you're not good enough. Then you separate, right? Like there's a separation of self from the indigenous ways of life and living. Yeah, to the ways of living, that's telling you that your ancestral foods are not good enough. And I think in the, in the ways that it also took place that may not necessarily be visible is one through trade agreements, right? So what happened was that there were a lot of investments that were then put into the cash crops that could be exported. This started to reflect in trade agreements. So that's one part of that. Boarding schools, what was considered as, as boarding schools are big in different parts of the, the continent. And my brain is thinking of Ghana and no other parts of the continent has it. So children, you know, from elementary, primary, and secondary school were then fed foods that were not indigenous foods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, 
This reminds me too of the term famine foods. And you also write about this in Africa's indigenous foods are not famine foods, where you write, quote, African native food should not be categorized as famine foods simply because they can grow and thrive in drought conditions. They are growing naturally in their ecosystems and their use extends beyond the environmental conditions they grow in. Our indigenous foods are not famine foods. They are our histories, our culture, and our traditions. Our native foods carry us and the future possibilities of a sustainable food system, end quote. Yeah, so I feel like this really connects to so much of what you were saying. And I'm wondering how is the idea of famine food connected to a global food system that separates people from their food and encourages unequal food distribution across the globe? So through colonialism, there was the adoption of, we we use this loosely, Western ways of being and seeing the world, right? So through language, through religion, through education. And so during that process, there was a divorce of the ancestral indigenous ways because the Western ways of seeing the world was constructed as direct opposition, right? From indigenous ways of being and seeing the world. So the indigenous ways was either seen as devilish, as backward. So nothing, right, of good could come from indigenous ways in contrast to the Western ways that were provided. And this demonstrated itself very well through religion on the continent and in many African countries that are predominantly Christian, you see this very often. And so anything that is attached to cultural, traditional, indigenous ways of seeing, it's seen as backward, etc. And so during the, the period where trade policies across various African countries started to reflect foods that could be exported, around that period to, I think, to give a bit more context, a lot of African countries were still colonized, right? The first country in Africa to get independence was Ghana. And that was like 1957. And it's not so long ago, if you come to think of it, right? That's the first country. So the impact of the colonial government is still deeply rooted in so many ways in how systems are run. And so when it comes to food, things shifted through trade policies. And so the Western nations that are connected to many African countries started to determine what could be consumed and what could not be consumed in terms of what they would export and what could be imported, right? What could come in as foreign foods, et cetera. But there was also seed loss, right? When World War II ended, there was also a lot of chemicals. And it's like, what do we do with all these chemicals? Well, turn them into agrochemicals. It was being pushed to the continent, the agrochemicals, the GM seeds with GMO corn coming in, GMO wheat, GMO soy. That was happening around the, the late 90s, 1997, 98. So all of this continued to devalue indigenous foods because one, foods was now commodified, right? If there isn't a market for the food, then it's not seen as, as worthy or worth it to bring in the, in the market. What happened around that time, because, because of the chemicals coming in, there was also a lot of wars. A lot of communities were being displaced, right? In different African countries. And as different communities were being displaced, people were losing their food systems. Millet and sorghum and foods that indigenous people ate because it's a part of how people lived were now being considered farming food in context to promoting a lot of foreign foods that were coming in. So the contextualization of African foods as farming foods, it's not something happening out of silos. It's happening in context to how trade policies are negotiated. It's happening in context to foods that are valued in the market. It's happening in context to agrochemicals, right? It's happening in in context to Western corporations, seed companies, or chemical companies that are able to lobby African governments. So all these things are are happening at the same time. And so there is no investment, research, or funding that is being put 
into any of the African indigenous foods because it goes back to what foods are valuable and who determines what foods are valuable. And if the food is not seen as being able to, if there's no space for the food in the global market, then the food is deemed and determined as food that's not valuable. So a part of the value in African food is calling it famine foods. Because if you call it famine foods, that it's a part of that dominant story that Africans can't feed themselves. If you call it famine food, then the Western country has a right to say, now we, we need to feed Africa because they can't feed themselves. So what I'm trying to say is that the idea of farming food, it's constructed within a lot of paradigms around the selling of agrochemicals, genetically modified food, trade policies, capitalism, the markets. And so foods that we have been consuming, the example I gave earlier, the year of millets, my people never stop eating millets. So I don't understand what this year of millets is or next year, the year of phone you because they never stop, right? But who gets to sit and determine and say, this is the year of millet, right? And I think the idea of that famine food goes back to that larger work and that larger narrative of colonialism and of capitalism. It's hard to come and sell chemicals and genetically modify seeds and promote someone's indigenous foods. It's just, it's just not going to work. So in order to be able to sell agrochemicals, then the argument has to be that indigenous foods are famine foods. You know, people just only eat them when it's hard times, not because they're drought resistant, they're climate resistant, they're nourishing, they have a long shelf life, because then you're not able to. All those companies and corporations are then not able to come in and sell right? The chemicals and the seeds and et cetera. There's so many moving pieces that impact that. And I'm trying to draw on all the other moving pieces. So currently our seeds are being modified with, you know, international laws that determine how farmers can save seeds, right? And what seeds they can save. So in order to be able to pass a seed law, now, the argument is that indigenous seeds are not viable, right? Because if indigenous seeds are viable, then you don't need a GMO seed. You don't need it. But in order to make the argument, in order for corporations and companies to own seeds, you know, to take seeds away from the field into a lab and have that ownership, the argument is that, well, indigenous seeds or peasant seeds oh, they're not viable. We can't depend on them anymore. They can't sustain. But these are foods that have sustained us, right? So it, it goes back to that larger narrative of devaluing, devaluing indigenous foods and devaluing indigenous farming systems. Love hearing you talk about seeds and yeah, there, there's more I want to ask. There's the more spiritual questions of seeds as portals and portals for life. And then of course, just more about the generation long practices of saving and storing seeds and what we can learn from our ancestors and folks who have been saving seeds for thousands of years and how that plays into how we store them today and just the importance of it because like we've been talking about how we work to keep seeds indigenous seeds out of colonialist capital capture and just the irony of climate change and food insecurity and water shortages and all these environmental challenges and how now all of a sudden indigenous seeds are being marketed and captured so there's so much here, and I know you've spoken to some of it, but if there's anything else you could speak to, whether on the more technical side of seed saving, ancestral cultural side, or the spiritual side, I'd love to just hear a bit more before we move on. Yeah, I think when I was farming, when I started farming a Black Creek farm 2013, 
the wonderful thing was you have the seed in your hand. It's not dead. It's a living thing. And then you take the seed and you put this in the soil. And it's magical. You put it in the soil and then it rains and there's sunshine. And this thing comes out and it's, it's just, it's a living thing and it's breathing and it's growing and it's feeding you and it's feeding other things. And for me, that was one of my first experiences. I would say awareness of, of just seeing the wonder of seeds. And in 2017, when I went to Bulga and I saw a baobab seed, I don't know if you've seen the baobab tree. It's, it's large. It holds about 10,000 liters of water in the trunk and it lives for up to 5,000 years. And I'm holding a baobab seed and I'm thinking, wow, like this large tree is in the seed. Like, are you kidding me? That this, this baobab tree that I'm seeing now came from this seed, that the past of this tree that I'm seeing was in this, like grandmother, great-grandmother and great-great-grandmother or father or parents of this tree was in the seed. And the future of a baobab tree is also in the seed of me, of all seeds, right? That the future, whether it's a she, a mango, you know, an apple, that the future of that tree that we are yet to plant is in that seed. What a wonder. If you've ever been like at the foot of a giant tree, it's just a miracle of life, really. That this living, breathing thing that has witnessed years before me, right? That has the recording of the environment of the sun, of water. It knows the system. If you've ever seen a baobab tree in the dry season, there is no leaf. It looks like a skeleton. There is no leaf. And during the raining season, it's full of leaves. It looks like it has an afro. It's so beautiful. And for me, life is telling me that all this information is in the seed. The tree knows how to heal itself. It's in the seed. The tree knows the seasons. It's in there. The tree knows its health benefits. It's in there. All this information. It knows the environment that it will thrive in. You can grow a baobab seed in the cold in, in Canada, right? The same way that made perhaps the maple tree might not grow necessarily. Some trees can grow, but they may not fruit, right? Because the environment of the tree's survival and thriving is all in the seed. And for me, that, that just blew me away. That just blew me away. You know, if you take a shade tree, when the leaves fall, the leaves are also compost for the soil. And so in 2017, like witnessing and seeing that completely propelled and I think grounded that understanding of ancestral foods and the spirituality of seeds. The seeds are past, they're present, they hold stories, they know the soil, they know where they belong, they know where they can thrive, you know, they know their ecosystem and just that component of understanding that. Yeah, I think that that's what grounded me around the spirituality. I would say the spirituality of seeds. But it was also seeing the ways in which farmers harvest seeds that they will seed save and how, you know, they save certain seeds. So for instance, if they harvested sweet potatoes and to preserve it and keep it long, they would dig the earth and then they will put the sweet potatoes in there. They'll put ash on it and cover it, and it will remain as fresh as the day you harvested it. You know, grains, how millet seeds are hung up, you know, in the kitchen area, in the storage area to leave it to dry. It was just seeing, seeing the practices, you know, of grinding this millet and fermenting it. It just, just the life, you know, seeds are living things. They're living things. They are, they are our ancestors, you know, seeds, our ancestors, they have been here before many of us were here. And they have also been here with our grandparents, you know. When a tree is dying, the seed is telling us something about the environment. When you plant a seed and it's no longer growing, but then the tree has lived for 10,000 years, that's information for us humans about our environment and nature and our food systems.
So for me, those are like the spiritual and cultural aspects of, of seeds. And I think some of the technical pieces are looking at how farmers just intentionally plant to nourish, right, the, the soil. So the farmers know to plant the banbara bean and the granites for nitrogen in the soil, right? And to also maximize space because those are lower crops. And then they plant the sorghum and the millet. And then they plant the, the squash around it. So it's just witnessing this archival knowledge that farmers hold so precious that is often disregarded, but so crucial that has sustained our life for so long. But farmers do it so effortless that we don't realize how crucial this knowledge is. But I think it was just witnessing that cultural aspect of seeds, that this very same seed that I can plant and get food, I can plant and have food grow out of it. I can also dry and, and grind it and ferment it, you know? That there are stories around how the seed is fermented, you know, stories around how millet seeds are used during wars, stories around how filling millet and sorghum and all these, all these foods are. And it's also, I think, how certain seeds come to life, right? Some seeds, some seeds are planted by birds. I think humans, we think we're, we're the only ones participating in sustaining this earth and the decisions we make and the policies that we make. And if we pause and realize how birds are replenishing the earth by taking one seed and planting it in a different place, one of the farmers that we work with, he has a garden and he always says the trees in his garden, the Dawa Dawa tree and the shade tree, he's like bats planted it, you know? He sees bats will eat the shade fruit and then when they poop it out, plants it and he's observed bats around his farm and he always talks about the roles that bird play in planting trees and if we pause and looked at what other species are replenishing the earth and sustaining the world outside of human activities we would be surprised right animals you know elephants that are eating fruits and planting unintentionally or intentionally planting trees and crops in somewhere else you know ants a community of ants that are moving seeds from one place to another. You know, some seeds also require fire before they can be planted. So even bringing seeds to life, there's so many ways. There's so many ways. And it's so wonderful to be able to witness. It's just the fruit. If you, you plant one seed, you get a tree that lives years. But then look at the fruit. I'll go back to the example of the baobab. It starts to fruit after 15 years. But if after 15 years, that tree lives 500 years or 415 years, we get a fruit every single, not just one, multiple fruits every single year for 450 years from one seed that was planted. Yeah. The, the, the other aspect I'll add about seeds, I think, is the communal aspect of seeds. Within indigenous or peasant seed systems, so peasant seed systems are people that have a closer relationship to the land whose sustenance, I would say, come from the land, maintaining the land and having a relationship with the land through food. So in peasant seed systems and in indigenous seed systems, there is a sharing and there is an exchanging of seeds. And I think it is so crucial, right, to biodiversity but also crucial to human connection and to community connection. So the exchanging of seeds, the sharing of seeds, that's what makes international seed laws dangerous because seeds are free. Nature gave them to us. So for a company or a corporation or a country to invest research and then to claim the intellectual property rights and the usage of that is very dangerous it's like a threat to life. It's really a war against life. If you think about all the ways that seeds have sustained humans, visible, invisible, seen on seeds, if we were to take an inventory of all the people that have participated in protecting, preserving, and saving seeds, if we took an inventory of that, a cultural inventory, and compare that to a company or a corporation, claiming intellectual property and then asking 
the folks that have been protecting these seats to now pay for it, it's absurd that we're in a time in human history that this is even something that should happen. Like the fact that it's even a conversation that we're okay with, I mean, we're not okay. People are resisting and fighting. But the fact that Allah has even been passed, that is given plan to breeders the right to own seeds. Bizarre. Bizarre. Like, are we even okay? We're not okay. It's so absurd to me. I can't, every time I, I try to process it, it's, I just, I just, how? Seeds? Now, not only are we saying that you're eating famine foods, but now we're, we're going to say, or the system or the law is going to say that we're going to take that famine food we're going to modify it and then you now have to buy it from us along with our chemicals. But then you're poor. It's absurd. So I can go on forever because I just, my brain is just like, yeah. how yeah. are we doing this in life? <laughs> yeah, I'm completely there with you. I, and I think speaking to the absurdity is necessary because it's insane. It's insane to live in an ecocidal culture. It's it's really out of control. And well, I feel like it would be nice to end on something that you had just brought up, which is community and just thinking about reimagining life on earth with community as guide, considering that so much of your work takes place in community. So I would just like to ask you, what could the world look like if we paid attention to our local communities and invested in local seed banks and really started to believe in those around us? A couple of things come to mind. Three, three things. Connection, trust, and love. You know, connection, trust, and love. When I think through some of the work that we have done, the bigger piece has been trust, you know, the connection and the trust. I think the first thing is the fact that we already know what to do. The communities that we've worked with, people know what it means to live in community with each other. People know what it means to be in service and to be of service with and to each other. And I think it's creating the space and creating the opportunity for people to be able to do that. And reimagining how we can live in community and having our seed banks is indigenous and ancestral ways of being. Because indigenous and ancestral ways of being for me means that life is not human-centered. We're not looking at humans. We're not looking at ourselves alone to solve the problem. We're not looking at a one community leader. We're not looking at an individual to give the answers. But we're coming together in connection with the land, with the trees, with the seeds. For me, reimagining a community future is not just centered on people. It's also centered on the land. It's also centered on other living things, on the seeds, you know, and the trees, as I mentioned, even on unseen things that are facilitating our existence. I think it's creating, learning how to create mutual space to be able to trust each other and to be able to coexist in that space, right? So I think whatever that ancestral indigenous ways mean within different people's geographic region, because it may not necessarily be the exact same, but I think as long as it honors living in a way that does not harm other people and does not harm the land and the rivers and the waters, right? In the future that I Imagine I cannot just be human centered while the land and the rivers, et cetera, are harmed. So I think that's the first point for me is living in an ancestral ways and also not being fixed on what that is, but also being open on how that shifts and that changes. I would say I am, or we've been socially conditioned to really see life in a particular way. And so sometimes it becomes really difficult to reimagine when. The new ways of being and living, right? It's in contrast to how we currently see life. So I think even in an ancestral indigenous ways of being, it's being open, being open to learning new, new things about our indigenous ways 
you know how the seeds, the one seed is the past, the present, and the future? So ancestral indigenous ways are not necessarily separate from the future as well, right? Because if you look, once again, the, the example of the baobab, the baobab seed has had many, it's come out of many trees that have lived in the past, right? But in the same seed, there are also many trees in it that will live in the future. So in the same way that in reimagining for me community is that there are many ancestral knowledge on how we can live in harmony, in connection, with trust, with love. And we have a lot of that knowledge in the past. But that knowledge also exists in the present, right? And it also exists in the future. And I think it's opening ourselves up to be able to do that. Another key piece, if I'm looking at seeds, is the sharing piece, right? I think using seeds as a lens on how to reimagine community and how to reimagine the future. These are about sharing, right? There is, there's a sharing, there's an exchanging, there is a given. And in looking at that value and that relationship that seeds bring, in recreating community, we have to learn that every single person is valuable. Your value does not come from performing. It doesn't come from doing something that is extractive, right? You are valuable just as you are as a human. A seed is valuable as it exists as a seed, right, in our hand. We don't say, okay, now that we've planted you and you've produced a, a tree, you're now valuable. We know the value of the seeds just in our hand as seeds. In the same way that in the future of community with other humans, we are valuable just, just by living, right? Everything else we do is extra. And so in reimagining that community, humans are valuable just in their existence, right? And sharing ideas, in exchanging knowledge, in, in being in, in service with and to each other. I'm looking once again from the lens of a seed, you know, and looking at community through what seeds bring us, right? Close to 300 people traveled to Benin in March across the African continent to protect and save indigenous seeds. That is community. For me, that, was the, that is the kind of future that I want, that for four days, we ate indigenous food for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. For four days, we communed on agroecology. We learned about the different ways in which different communities are protecting different seeds, right? It's, it's the sharing of our humanity. I think that's it. What can a seed tell me about community? What a seed informs me about itself is how I see I, I want to say, yeah, reimagine it, a community, right? I think the first is looking at our ancestral indigenous ways of being and how we can live in harmony with the waters and land and seeds and other living things as well. And the second piece would be the sharing and exchanging of our service and our thoughts and our ideas and our existence. And the third piece is harmony. I think living in harmony, just sitting on their tree and see how three or four different species of trees are just there in harmony with each other. Oh, Avina, this was so beautiful. Thank you for sharing your time and your heart and your passion with us. It was a really energizing conversation and yeah, just appreciate spending this time with you. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Ayana. Thank you for, for having me. It was fantastic just to sort of, yeah, see some of these things out loud. <laughs> and yeah, sometimes when you're doing work connected to seed and land and water, you just realize how much like earth loves you, you know, like I'm just here and the seed loves me enough to feed me, you know, it loves me enough to give me Land loves me enough to give me fresh drinking water. And the land offers itself because of love for me to grow food because it trusts that I will live in harmony with it all. You know, so hearing you read the quote and hearing myself, I was like, what an honor, you know, it is for, yeah, for the land to just trust us to be in harmony with it, to protect and to preserve. So thank you for, for having me. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thanks for listening to For the Wild. The music you heard today is by Buffalo Rose, Marion McLaughlin, and Eliza Edens. For the Wild is created by Ayana Young, Erica Ekram, Julia Jackson, Jackson Krupp, and Evan Tenenbaum. Yeah.